So up next we have, oh dear, don't do that. Uh, we have a pretty exciting treat for us all. Stop that. Uh, we have a panel. Woo, panel, yeah. Um, this next session features some top talent here, and we are here to chat about finding and, uh, and securing stuff. Oh, I added all that to the document. That's pretty cool. So it's about finding and uh, supporting critical open source projects. So for our first panelist is Amir Montzeri. He's the Managing Director of OSTIF, the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. It's a nonprofit organization that provides tools, services, and audits and support for open source projects. So Amir, please find a stool of your liking. Next to Amir is gonna be Caleb Brown. He's a software engineer working in Google's open source security team on finding critical projects and analyzing behavior of open source packages. So Caleb, please come find a stool. And finally, we have Julie Ferroli. She is a developer, researcher, and open source maintainer and podcaster, yay. Uh, one of my favorite hobbies. Um, she is active in the OpenSSF community, helping with the Securing Critical Projects Working Group and researching project criticality while advocating for solutions that work with open source maintainers. So this is our last presentation before lunch. No pressure panel to stay on time. <laughs> and we have our slide appearing right meow. Oh dear. No. <laughs> Look at that. Yay. Yay. Right. So panel, take it away. Thank you, Jory. Thank you. Thank you, Krobe and Jory and everybody for having us today. We're super excited to speak with you all about uh, finding Libraska. So everyone has seen this amazing uh, <laughs> graphic before, and um, we're really, really focused on, on finding those projects and securing them. Um, so I'm super excited to be here with my fellow panelists. Yes. And I guess we didn't really talk about how we would um, like formally start, but uh, really excited to be here. Um, Julia? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm Julia. Uh, I, am I am officially an open source technical leader at Cisco. That's my uh, pretty, pretty awesome title. Um, and I'm also the co-maintainer or co-founder of Open Source Stories, um, a community-driven project to capture untold narratives in open source. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. And I'll pass it off to Caleb. G'day, I'm Caleb, and you can tell by the accent, I'm not from this country. Uh, I'm uh, with Google on the Google Open Source Security team, uh, with a few of us here. And yeah, as mentioned before, I work on um, uh, the criticality scoring project um, and the package analysis project, which is lots of fun. So I'm um, very interested in today's topic. Um, yeah, my pronouns are he, him, and yeah. Awesome, thank you. And I'm Amir from OSTIF, OSTIF. Um, we, as, a, as Crow mentioned, we focus on solving the problem of securing critical projects. Um, that has been manifested through uh, coordinated, managed audits, security audits, um, which I guess will be a good segue into kind of why we're interested in the topic. So I can kind of veer into that and then love to hear your perspectives. But, um, I'm involved, uh, the reason I care about this problem is because, as mentioned earlier, um, our organization is working really hard to try and solve this problem, um, taking from some leading research in vulnerabilities, um, shows that lots of times to find those really deep-seated problems and those vulnerabilities in software projects, you really need to dig deep and, and go in to find, to find the juicy bugs, so to speak. Um, so by doing that for the last seven years, and uh, you know, thankfully with OpenSSF and, and a lot of the foundations and uh, larger organizations starting to care about this problem more um, and be much more actively involved in it, uh, we're doing a lot of audits and uh, of, of open source projects, and in doing that, um, trying to find uh, better ways to identify those projects that are just so important that everyone depends on, but might be overlooked by maybe 
some tooling, or we, we were actually just having a good conversation outside about community size as, as a metric, how that can be a little bit misleading. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I'd like to think I'm very close to the problem and uh, happy to share um, experiences doing that with everyone today. And uh, yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, I, I'm interested in this project because um, I'd like to avoid another log for shell. I don't know how many people were involved in rolling incident management on this in the room, but um, I, fortunately I wasn't. There were people in our team who were. Um, so getting ahead of that, the next one of those would be really good, and hopefully it's not a zero day. Um, so that's one interest. I'm also interested in, this, in helping people who consume open source to understand, I guess, their exposure and their risk, um, and hopefully motivate them towards investing in improving that, particularly the ones that are uh, like Log4j, where there's a small handful of developers working really hard, um, and being able to invest their resources that they've got into that, um, into those places that really need it to improve the security for the entire eco ecosystem. Well said. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so I, I work. I have worked in open source programs offices and uh, in different companies, and I think my interest boils down to pain management uh, because I am not the person fixing the bugs. I'm the person managing like the efforts to figure out who's using all of these open source packages um, and. Worse, who's responsible for fixing them? Um, and so I, I really want to help people avoid the pain of having to drop their entire work, their entire life, to go and fix open, their open source dependencies. Um, and I started doing research in this in maybe it was like 20, 2018. I was actually at Google at the time um, looking into where investment should be where, like, if something fell over, like happened in 2014, if you remember, 2014, 2015, a couple of times actually, um, like how can we respond faster? How can we figure out that some of these projects need the extra help? Um, and so I developed a framework to help identify those projects um, that, I, I think I released that somewhere. So. Yep. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And as a work group, um, the Securing Critical Projects Working Group, uh, this has been one of our main objectives is coming up with a well, um, well fleshed out list of, you know, the most critical projects um, out there. And that the idea or the, the intention for that is to kind of help, as Julia mentioned, guide resources um, to put attention on projects that probably could use the help, because I've never come across an open source project that said, no, we don't need any help at all, please, no. Um, so, so finding those projects and, and being able to support them proactively um, is, has been a big uh, part of what we've been doing as a work group. But, it has not come without its challenges because, as you know, um, lists are hard just in inherently. Um, you're never going to have a perfect list that will appeal to everybody and, 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 and um, based on how they consume open source. But being able to at least come up with something, um, uh, again, it does, we're under the impression that it doesn't have to necessarily be perfect. It never is going to be perfect. but. Um, I, I invite uh, my fellow panelists to talk about kind of what have been some of the challenges with kind of getting consensus on that, even measuring that, um, and maybe from, from your previous experience too, if you want to talk about you know, how lessons learned from there. Um, yeah, let's do that. Do you want to talk about lessons learned, Julia? Yeah, so one of the big challenges that, that we identified early on is the, the trouble of comparison, right? We've got a lot of different types of open source projects out there, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that by the time I finish speaking this sentence, there will be like five or 10 more started. So it, that might be a floor, actually. Um, 
But they're shaped very, very differently. They serve different functions. Um, and one of the starting points that I took was from uh, Nadia Egbal's Road and, Roads and Bridges uh, publication from the Ford Foundation, uh, where she categorized a bunch, of diff a bunch of different types of open source projects. Um, and it, it included like databases, libraries, frameworks, et cetera. And until you slice and dice open source projects, you're going to wind up with one list that is not representative, right? And we've found this with languages as well. Do you, do you want to talk about the, the problem with, with languages? Sure, yeah. Um, it, I think it's a fantastic point that, again, there really is no absolute here. Um, but the fact one being that, and, um, and I like how Anne uh, Bertuccio had this on the first line, open source just inherently is critical. So I think one of the um, challenges is really kind of just drawing the line in the sand and starting from somewhere. Because, you know, in the time it takes to, let's say, gain consensus on a project, um, there could very well be plenty of new projects being introduced, vulnerabilities in, in these projects being exploited that aren't being found uh, proactively. Um, so really just having something and then having something actionable to start moving forward in terms of going from identifying projects to actually taking steps towards securing them. And um, I personally am much more in the, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And, you know, sure, if you survey, let's say, a thousand people, whether project X or Y is critical, you're, you'll probably get, you know, a relatively high percentage of those saying yes. So um, really just trying to, to move the needle forward. Um, and, and as you said, yes. Um, Languages play a part, platforms, um, um, even the functionalities of, of the projects. Um, you know, is a, you know, a project that runs, that may not be used by a lot of people, but is a critical part of the Large Hedron Collider project, I mean, is that critical? I mean. Well, if, if we don't want things to explode, <laughs> I think things are, are more critical than not. Right? Indeed, like, yes, or like power well, plants shutting down. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the challenges is, um, you don't know where the software is being used. You don't know the data that it is using to secure. What is the value of the system that this software is being used within is really hard to quantify. And so if you actually want to measure the real impact of uh, well, what, what really is critical, you'd be able to like, be a god, an omniscient, and be able to see all the applications of a piece of software and know. But unfortunately, we don't have that. So we have to come up with other ways of figuring that out. And I think that's, that's a good um, segue to one of the points that was made uh, earlier in the day, is that we don't have the telemetry that we used to. We don't have the trust. Um, and when it comes to securing infrastructure um, and identifying the projects most critical for infrastructure, however you define that, um, we are. We have a lot of private companies involved in that, and they can't necessarily make their dependencies public. Yeah. Because that can be an attack vector. So figuring out how to collect that information in a neutral, responsible, and representative way is is. is is a big challenge, and it relies on a lot of self-reporting. Mm. Yeah, I think there's, there's. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping in the future things like S bombs, and Git bombs, and other um, ways of cataloging software and dependencies helps in this process. Um, but it, I think it's going to be an evolutionary process where over time, as things like S bombs are adopted, and the companies are more, I guess. Uh, happy to, to be revealing this sort of information that you'll, over time, um, be uh, able to get a better sense of how critical software is being used across um, yeah, the ecosystem. So one day, hopefully, we have that ability to see what's, how things are being used, but 
um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a process and a time when that will be the case. And a, and a wish list. Yeah. Like, dependencies and dependency count and software composition analysis is great. But also, I want to see how much time is being spent uh, in processes, in functions, um, when they're being run. Because, you know, my, my favorite example for critical software is, um, is a, a Fortran package. Sure. <laughs> yes, bl blast, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so that, a lot of time, a lot of processing time is spent in BLAS. And it's probably not on a lot of people's radars. Yeah. But the good thing is, is at least the, move, the needle is moving yes. forward, um, despite it being a constantly moving target, which makes it even more challenging. Um, but you have like research, like, uh, like the Census 2 research mm -hmm. that, that did a lot of work on finding you know, what are the most used repositories and um, other research going on in the space is helping moving the needle, but it is, it is definitely a challenge, absolutely. Um, mm. like how do you do that at scale and like, keep it up to date as well? Like the Harvard census is, uh, like, takes time to produce. It's a point in time view of things, um, but like, it's like the more, more, more open source projects being created Every second, like it's a changing landscape, and my problem with that, that picture up there is that it's that's a point in time picture, and someone can the Lib Nebraska guy can like add another dependency to that tiny little thing there, and like suddenly your whole picture changes. So Make that's it even more skinny. That's right. <laughs> um, I think we had a question. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking about research. What like data do you rely on when you research uh, criticality? It's not clear to me. Yes, so, that is a great question. The, the question, do you want to restate the question? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, what type of metrics are we looking at when we're talking about or measuring criticality? Um, Caleb, do you want to talk about that a little? So I, I'm still getting up to speed on all the, the research and uh, papers that are available. Some of the ones I've seen uh, are, are based on dependencies and, and looking at how they work. Um, that works in languages that have uh, clear dependent data. Um, so like Python or, or Node, you can see that. It doesn't easily track across uh, transitive dependencies, that sort of research. Um, I've seen other research in the space around um, uh, truck factor and like trying to understand like how many people have a cognitive understanding of a piece of code um, and using uh, what the, Git, the data in Git or in your software repository to answer that question. Um, other researchers looked at like how do, um, what's the time around the issue res resolution and those sorts of questions as well. You can also, if you want to take in other in data as well, maybe the number of source lines of code, maybe who are the organizations contributing? Is there a diversity there in that space? So there's lots of metrics um, and uh, when we start to formulate um, some automation and, and scoring around this, um, we re really want to look towards um, academic research in this space to be able to like, have some uh, sensible reason for actually using something or including a, a metric or a signal um, in trying to calculate those scores. Does that help answer the question? Do you want to add anything? I have, I, have, I have so many opinions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so academic research, yes. Um, I think we need to be more involved in... in participating in acad and guiding academic research. Uh, we are seeing more and more inst research institutions having an, an, an OSPO, an open source programs office, that can help them understand open source software better. Um, but they still need some guidance, because open source isn't necessarily built into their DNA the way that it is for many of us here. Um, the problem that I see with academic research is that they keep falling into the same pit of assuming that GitHub is your source of truth. Um, and that is very problematic um, for, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, and there's also the, the idea that metrics all metrics are good metrics. No, they're not. 
all data is good data. No, it's not. Um, I need to finish a paper, actually, that it, a position paper on this on this subject uh, that's sitting in my open drafts folder. <laughs> but um, we need to help help guide guide them in identifying the metrics that are that are useful. Please don't use stars on GitHub. That's not a that's, that's not a good metric to use. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then, and then I was just going to add that as important as qualitative data is, especially, or I'm sorry, quantitative data is, especially when it comes to scaling and be able to do some of this at scale, um, qualitative data is important too, um, which is why one thing that I've been trying to incorporate into our process is some type of like a community curation kind of a thing where um, we, can, we can source that kind of those qualitative data metrics that might not be apparent on a, on a tool or by looking at a GitHub or something like that. So as important as the, the, the quantitative metrics and the, um, the research is, I, I think the, the sourcing from the, the, the folks actually maintaining projects, working on these projects is going to be an important data point too. We have a question over here. Awesome. So uh, really, Oh, great. Okay. Uh, totally love uh, all the different perspectives on the panel. Uh, one thing that we're pretty concerned about is a lot of the attention has been on the modern application development side of things. Uh, and so we use the term critical infrastructure, meaning IT, but in fact, right, the things that are very relevant to human lives and safety tend to be the most undermeasured, uh, whether it's embedded systems or medical devices or, you know, the things that go boom or fizzle. Uh, and last, that's one of the weaknesses in Frank's study. Um, do you guys have some thoughts about how we can engage in those software communities and get better visibility? Yeah. Oh. So I, I, uh, I noped out of getting a, a, a medical device implanted because they couldn't tell me about the, <laughs> the security. And I'm like, I do not want some random person administering shocks to my spinal cord. Thank you very much. So yes, that's, I think we are overly focused on our, our com representative companies' um, interests, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be more engaged with the medical community, with the, the people running power plants, the people that are running like, you had another one that I can't remember what you said. Things that go boom. Things that go boom, yeah. like data centers sometimes. <laughs> um, oh, or military equipment, yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm. Um, and I think that, I think we probably need help. Mm. Like, we need help figuring out who to talk to. Um, because a lot of the people aren't here, right? Oh, we have yeah. another question. Awesome. Hi. So I'm not from the Elisa Group. I'm from Open UK. Hi. Um, we've been working quite a lot on trying to find better data and better metrics. And I personally don't like the way we measure the economic value. I think we look at total cost of ownership, which is very out of date. We look at lines of code in. We look at number of developers. The data isn't reliable to start with, but it's a really old school way of thinking about it. And we're trying to shift more to look at investment and to look at value generated by open source in so many different ways across, across things like cloud infrastructure. We also are looking beyond economic value. And we think one of the biggest things that we have as an open source community is all the additional value we add to society. And it's, it's not something that can be measured in money. And we will launch our sustainability day in November what we're calling societal value metrics. There'll be a V1, and we need lots of help to make them better and better, but we've started with the sustainable development goals to give us 17 base points, and then we're gonna refine that. So there will be something launched by November as a V1. Anybody who's interested in getting involved would be very welcome, and we will do more year on year to improve those. Hmm. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, I think there's a, in terms of signal quality, um, I think there's a combination of 
keep looking for better signals and keep finding them. And, and it's great to know that people are doing that and um, that there is investment in that space. It, but I think, yeah, we, at the same time, keep working on like, using the ones that we've got to, to try and like, calculate or determine what we know so far is the critical stuff so that we can invest in that area, but let's improve the signal collection so that we can make sure that we're not missing something that ac is actually really critical that we haven't seen um, that's yeah, hiding yeah. down the, the pile of things. And yeah. the call for participation comes the other way, like bring, bring your knowledge, bring mm. what you're learning to, to the working group because the, the, um, the impact of, of open source and securing open source definitely, it, it, it spreads, right? It radiates, that's the word I was looking for. We have a question yeah. over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, can you hear me or? Yeah. yeah. We've got a, Jory's oh, got a Jory's got a mic. Thank you so much. Uh, so this resonates a lot with the work that I uh, criticize from academia to other academics. Uh, to follow up with some, uh, some questions around uh, what we've been finding, uh, on, on my lab, we're trying to understand the cross-ecosystem analysis rather than just looking at, say, NPM and Docker or blah. And we find that it's really highly interconnected. And most of it really does, does boil down to the Linux distros, right? If you're going embedded, you're going to find a bunch of Yocto around. If you're going embedded, you're probably going to find some uh, free Artos and uh, things of this nature. So my question is, why don't we approach, say, the, those communities that I find surprising sometimes they're not very engaged with the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, and as a follow-up, uh, which may be a little tangential, another finding that worried me a lot was that uh, these <coughs> ecosystems are actually unstable. If you sample the graph of dependencies on a Monday, you will get different critical packages than if you sample the graph on Friday. This means that it is not that easy to just say, hey, these 10 packages are the ones that we really need to, to take care of, but rather, when do we need to incentivize, or how can we stabilize this graph so, so that we can actually start working on it? That's a great question, Santiago. Do you, do you want to take us? Anyone want to take a stab? So, um, I'll take a stab at the, the first part of the question, I think, and, and correct me if I'm getting off topic, please. I tend to do that. Um, so I think that there, are, there, there is research around the cross-ecosystem analysis, right? There's um, the, uh, the, the Project Ocean, which is open source complex ecosystems and networks coming out of the UVM uh, Complex System Center that is digging into this, and it's a cross-disciplinary approach. Um, so that's... There, there are initiatives out there. You, you do have to kind of work to find them. Um, so that's the, at least the first part of the question, I think. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, do you have, do you have anything else? Um, I, yeah, the, the fact that the graph is changing all the time is really hard. Like, yeah. And it, it, it's part of why this is uh, like one, it's a wicked problem. Um, it's part of why we, we use dependence as a, a, a kind of proxy for the impact. Um, I think in some, in, in terms of my thinking about it has been to kind of ignore that the graph is changing because the things that are um, really critical, uh, the number of people depending on it will be high enough that the, hopefully those things elevate. Um, that, that doesn't work so well where those relationships are not explicit, um, but at least that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Um, in terms of like the future and how to make that better, yeah, I think we like under, being able to measure the dependent relationships will be really important, um, but I don't think we're ever going to get away from having to live with like the graph changing all the time. Yeah. I think you make a great point as well. It, it definitely seems like lots of times when we're trying to answer these questions that there are common denominators or projects that typically do come up time and time again, which I think at that point, it's safe to say that hey, this is probably a, a pretty critical project. I mean, if it comes up in all the, no matter how you think about the question, um, it comes up, 
that you keep getting those projects. And that could be a great place to start. You know, start with those that, you know, if you were to sample 100 people, 99 of them would say, oh, yeah, this is important. We should be focusing on this. Um, but again, that's really hard when you have, again, different needs, um, different uses for open source. Um, and there really is no absolute. There's not a lot of absolutes in open source, so, um, or I guess in life in general. But, <laughs> um, but especially in open source, because I mean, even, I mean, we spent a good amount of time just talking about what critical meant, you know? Mm. And so. I don't I, think we've, we've agreed on a definition, even. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we have, yeah. <laughs> no, but no, we, we certainly have. And um, it just goes to show that I, I think it's, obviously, it's very important to think about the problem. And that's something we're doing a lot. And it's nice to see that happening on such a broader scale. Um, but at the same time, you know, action and experience teaches us a lot of things, right? Um, you can read about how to ride a bike for years and you know, get on one and not know what you're doing. You know? So I think there needs to be a little bit of both in terms of you know, um, doing the research, but also ex a little bit of experimentation or, or trying things to actually move the needle here. And, and I think lots of times those types of experiences um, produce those kind of results where like, hey, you know, we audited project A and saw that project B seems very important. So, you know, that could be something to look into or, um, so yeah, so I, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> oh, it's, thank a, you, it's like yeah, criticality is, uh, like one person's critical project is someone might not care at all. And so there's a, I think part of the, the discussion around what is critical is that everybody has kind of a slightly different opinion about it. Like, is something that's been receiving investment in the security space actually critical? Um, is, or is this thing that's got a corporate backer, is that a critical project? So there's yeah, lots of questions around. Lots of questions, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I just advocate for, when we're thinking about this problem, a lot of nuance, mm. right? Um, because there's, in capturing like dependency graphs and metrics and qualitative data as well, like we're going to grab a lot of nuance that shouldn't shouldn't necessarily be lo lost. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that that I think about criticality is by allowing a lot of freedom for people to decide what what factors signal criticality to, to them. Um, and leaving a, an, an open framework is very difficult. Um, but if we go back to one of the challenges, which is the fact that we've got a lot of companies that, or governments, or utilities, or, or, or um, relying on open source software, can we give them a way to discover their most critical projects without not necessarily opening up their private data set? Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Um, should we take maybe like one or two more questions? I'm not sure how long we have until. I think we're. I think we're like five to ten. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so we could take a um, couple of questions and then maybe we can adjourn just a little early. Look. Folks get to lunch, so. This side has been remarkably quiet. So, and I'm not sure if that's just because I can't turn that way, but um, <laughs> if there are any questions from, from that side of the audience or not, not limited to. There's a hand at the back. Oh, uh, hello. Behind me, I wasn't <laughs> very sneaky. Hey, um, I just really wanted to return to this idea of like criticality in terms of ecosystems, right? Because I think something that we missed in this discussion so far is how different that looks when you slice it by language, right? That's really the differentiating factor here, right? Is it a chaos model or is it a top down, we've decided that we're incubating these projects as an ecosystem, right? Those are two very different approaches to deciding what we prioritize for security and what we grow with as a global community. So it's, uh, it's something that I'm reflecting on right now in my own role, because I have to look at this across different ecosystems. Um, 
and I'm seeing it probably be the differentiator between what languages are still going to be used in 10 years and what aren't, right? Because if your idea of criticality is changing on a week-to-week -week basis, that's not what I would consider a stable ecosystem. So I'd love to think a little bit more about what can we do at a foundational level and as a federated level to be engaging not just in a solo ecosystem, but across them to make those look more congruent? Mm -hmm. That's a fine question. Um, I can, I can. Um, one thing that has helped for us, um, and when I say us, I mean on the, on the audit side with OSTIF, is having an, an advisory council or people basically who are in the space to talk about these things, right? Because you do have a lot of edge cases, um, you have a lot of emerging technologies, projects that could very well become the de facto standard in five, ten years, and um, recognizing that as soon as possible and um, taking steps towards securing those projects um, is, a, is a great approach because you're, you're able to be proactive and even help um, increased adoption of those projects um, by recognizing them as, as kind of maybe edge cases or emerging uh, projects that could be new standards. Um, lots, lots of times it just goes back to, I think, the curation piece. You know, we want to get the opinions and thoughts of, of the folks who are doing this every day, you know, whether directly or indirectly, and being able to curate that into something actionable. Um, I, I think would be extremely valuable. So my answer would be um, just having strong kind of curation processes and giving folks a voice to be able to say, like, you know, have you considered this or have you considered this project um, to look into further? Yeah, I, th I think ecosystem, like looking at each, e looking at ecosystems and trying to kind of invest in understanding each one is really valuable. I think we focus a lot on the ones that have easy data to get at. Um, so, and, and ones that have high profile incidents. Um, but like, for example, uh, Python um, and Node, uh, very easy to, to measure their dependence. They're used a lot in web um, spaces. And so the attacks are frequent. Um, they may not have the highest impact though. Um, it's harder in the IoT space or in medical devices and those things, a lot of that's embedded code. And we don't have a heap of visibility in that space. And those languages that they use there are ones that may not have as much memory safety or th those sorts of things. Uh, so there's greater exposure there. So yes, I, like, I, I think that there is a challenge in being able to do that. Um, yeah, and over time we'll have to like, invest more in understanding how to get into, that, um, into those spaces to be able to provide good answers and, and understand the criticality of the dependencies in that space. I actually have a question for y'all. <laughs> Who here has read the census two? Okay. I really highly recommend reading that report um, because it does touch on the different, some of the ecosystem factors that, that make this a hard problem. Um, and I won't call out any of the ecosystems here. Um, but we do see that the development patterns, the, um, the social patterns, communication patterns, they all impact differently for different types of languages. Um, and so understanding that and, and kind of curving for that is, is a hard problem. It is a hard problem, especially if you're trying to do cross-ecosystem analysis. Um, the way that like, it, it goes in my head is, I think in matrices. So I think in like, okay, well, we've got, we've got a, um, a Python project that does this. Um, it is this type of, this shape of project. Um, and we can add on dimensions as we see fit, right? And being able to compare like to like or like-ish to like-ish is, is hard, but I think worth it, so. 
Wonderful. So um, we could probably take one more question if there, if there, if someone has a burning question. Otherwise, we will be around most of the week. So if you'd like to talk about this, uh, please, you know, let us know. Um, highly recommend joining the or participating in the Securing Critical Projects Working Group to talk about this. And I just wanted to thank everybody. I have one question. All right. Well, when is the next meeting of the Securing Critical Projects Working Group? It's probably Excellent week. question. <laughs> Yes. There is a Slack. And there is a Slack as well, Slack. yes, good point. I think the last working group meeting was the Friday just been too, is that correct? I, it was just last yeah. Thursday, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, different time. Oh, it's Friday <laughs> for yeah, you, yeah. right. Um, so we do currently meet every other week uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, Central Time. Um, we are working on potentially doing maybe an every other where one session, I've seen other working groups do this too, be yes, more please. APAC, yeah, APAC please. friendly uh, for different time zones. Um, but also a great point, we have the Slack as well you know, for folks who might not be able to join the meetings, so um, participation via Slack is more than welcome. We're also, I think there's, um, I think there's a GitHub repo yes. as well. Yes, I've point. been committing to it, and if anyone wants to talk to me about that project, please, please do. Commit yourself. Yes. <laughs> um, awesome. I think that is a great way to end um, our panel. Seriously, <laughs> thank you all so much for having yeah. us. Thank you. <laughs>